All right, everyone, welcome back. Now we're at the second lecture of chapter nine, where we will be continuing to look at muscular tissue. Previously, we looked at the anatomy of muscles and muscle tissue, both at the macroscopic and microscopic level. Now we are going to be looking at the functionality of that muscle tissue. We are gonna see the physiology, the how, of the muscle contractions. So, as always, let's begin with our not really attendance questions. There's quite a few today, but they're all going to tie into today's lesson. First, where is calcium stored when it is inside a cell? Next, why is calcium stored in something when it is inside a cell? What is a sarcomere? What are the two primary proteins found at a sarcomere? And how is an action potential passed from one neuron to the next? Go ahead and pause your video. Try to answer those questions to the best of your ability because like I said, they will tie in to today's lesson quite a bit. Okay, hopefully you've done that. Let's take a look to see what the correct answers are. First, where is calcium stored when it is inside a cell? Remember, calcium, when it is inside a cell, which typically it's not, but when it is, it's not just free floating. It must be stored inside the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. But since we're talking about muscles, remember muscles and nerves uh, both we like to use different terminology when we're talking about those cell types. So in a muscle cell, a myocyte, instead of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, we call it a sarcoplasmic reticulum. Next, why is calcium stored inside something, inside a cell? Well, because calcium likes to bind to things and as a general rule, we don't want that. Calcium is something that likes to bind to things, kind of like oxygen did, but we really don't want that to happen. So calcium is packed away to where it can't bind to anything. What is a sarcomere? Remember a sarcomere is the functional contractile unit of muscle, both skeletal and we will also see in bio 139 and maybe a little bit at the end of this chapter cardiac. Cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle both use sarcomeres, and sarcomeres are the functional contractile unit of muscle cells. What are the two primary proteins found in a sarcomere? Well, there were quite a few proteins that make up a sarcomere, but the two primary were actin and myosin. We will be looking at those quite a bit today. And finally, how is an action potential passed from one neuron to the next? Remember when we got to a synapse where one neuron meets another neuron, there was that open gap, the synaptic cleft. And it was difficult uh, because you can't pass an electrical current across an open gap. So what did the neurons have to do? Well, they used neurotransmitters, chemicals that are released from the sending neuron that travel across that gap, and then they bind to things on the receiving neurons and cause some sort of either exciting the second neuron or inhibiting the second neuron. So the two neurons could still communicate that way across the gap using neurotransmitters. Okay, so just kind of a real quick refresher. In our previous lecture, we looked at the structure of a muscle cell, skeletal muscle cell, and we saw here those myofibrils. Remember, a myofibril were all those long units inside of a muscle cell. And then those myofibrils contain sarcomeres, and a sarcomere runs from this zigzag area called a Z-disc to the next Z-disc. Everything in between those two Z-discs is that one sarcomere, and then they repeat 
end after end after end the length of the muscle cell. And we said now that those sarcomeres are the functional contractile unit of muscle. So this is where the contraction takes place. Even though the whole muscle is contracting, it is at the myofibril, specifically at the sarcomere level, where the contraction is actually occurring. So up at the top of this image, we see an actual micrograph or a picture through a microscope of some muscle cells. And those striations that really make skeletal muscle stand out, those we said were caused by those sarcomeres, the different areas of the sarcomere. Here we have the artist's rendition. Here we've pulled one of those myofibrils out and we are looking at that. And now down at the bottom here, we've got an actual sarcomere as drawn by the author. So what is it that's happening at the sarcomere to cause a contraction? Well, we sum it up by something called the sliding filament theory. And the sliding filament theory, it says a few things. But first, it says that all of those proteins that we learned about, the actin, the myosin, both of which we just talked about, but also all of the other proteins, they do not get smaller. So it seems like that actin and myosin should shrink if this is a contraction because the whole muscle gets shorter but the actin and the myosin, they do not get shorter. Instead, they slide past each other. That is the sliding filament theory. Now we'll look a little bit more at some of the other things that that theory says, but to sum it up, the actin and the myosin do not shorten. They slide past each other. So let's see what that means. So here, the, the thicker blue lines, those represent myosin, the thick filaments. The thinner red lines, those represent actin, the thin filaments. We can see the M line, we can see the A band, but most importantly, let's look at the Z disc. What are they doing? The area between the Z disc is getting shorter. The Z disc is moving towards the M line on each side of the cell. The actin is moving towards the M line on each side. Or I said on, of the cell, but I mean of the sarcomere. Here down here we can see the I band, and the I band we can see is getting shorter. The I band, remember, was the area where there was no myosin. There were no thick filaments. There were only thin filaments. So it is this area right here, represented by this blue bar. There is a shortening of this area because the Z disc and those thin filaments are moving or sliding towards the M line. That's the sliding filament theory. That's what we see when we talk about the sliding filament theory. So let's go back to the previous slide and look here at our sarcomere. So the other things that the sliding filament theory says, we just said that it says the proteins do not shorten. Actin and myosin do not get any shorter. The thin filaments of each sarcomere so all of these blue lines, all of these blue lines, the thin filaments of each sarcomere, they get pulled towards the M line. That's what we just saw here, except the red in this image. They're getting pulled towards the M line. The I bands shorten. Remember the I band was the area where there was no thick filament. It is the area between the ends of the thick filaments of one sarcomere and the thick filaments of the next sarcomere. The H zone, remember the H zone was the area in between the thin filaments of a single sarcomere. 
The M line runs right down the middle of the H zone. But here, this is the H zone between these two thin filaments. Well, the H zone shortens. But depending on how strong of a contraction it is, not only does the H zone shorten, the H zone may disappear entirely. As this thin filament gets pulled towards the end line and this thin filament gets pulled towards the end line, the area between them gets smaller. But if it's pulled all the way to the end line, well, the H zone vanishes. The distance between one Z disc and the next, so really the length of the sarcomere, gets shortened because this Z disc is also moving towards the M line, and this Z disc is moving towards the M line. So the distance between the two is going to shorten. Let's see that again. Here's one Z disc, here's another Z disc, and we can see the distance between them is shortening. The A bands, so those thin, or the, the thick filament length, the length of the A band from one end of the myosin to the next end of the myosin within one sarcomere. The A bands are going to move closer together. That does not mean this specific A band is going to move closer together. It means the, I, the A band of this sarcomere and the A band of the adjacent sarcomeres, they are all going to move closer together. Because remember, the I band is shortening. So the distance between the thick filaments of this sarcomere and the thick filaments of this sarcomere, they're going to get closer together as the distance between them shrinks. And lastly, if the sarcomeres are shortening, that means the myofibrils are shortening. If the myofibrils are shortening, that means the muscle cell is shortening. And if the muscle cell is shortening, that means the entire muscle is shortening. Because, let's backtrack a little bit. Here we go, because remember, the length of the muscle cell is the length of the fascicle, which is the length of the muscle. So if any one of these shrink, it's going to shrink the length of the entire muscle. And remember we had that protein dystrophin dystrophin anchored the sarcomeres to the connective tissue of the muscle, which is what allowed us when these sarcomeres, you know, when they shrank, when they contracted, that caused the muscle itself to contract. So there is our sliding filament theory in action. But what is it that actually causes these filaments to slide past each other? So we have to kind of approach this from a different angle. What we see here is another micrograph, a photo taken through a microscope, of something called neuromuscular junctions. Neuromuscular junctions. So what we're seeing here, these black lines, those are axons. And they come to an end at an axon terminal, and the axon terminal has axonal boutons. Remember where those neurotransmitters were stored. That's what these small little black circles and ovals are. So the neuron is coming down, its axon begins to branch, and at the end of those terminal branches are our terminal boutons. 
In all likelihood, this is one neuron whose axon, we're seeing the axon terminals where they kind of branch out, and then at the end of each one, there are those terminal boutons. We can't really see if this is one single axon because it's up out of the screen. There may be a couple here, but it looks like it's probably one, and we are seeing those branches at the end at the axon terminal. So we're going to be paying very close attention to these neuromuscular junctions, which is exactly what it sounds like it would be. Neuro, neuron, nerve cell, muscular, muscle cells we see here, skeletal muscle cells. A neuromuscular junction is where a neuron meets or joins with a muscle cell. This is an actual image, but here is the same thing as an artist's rendition. Here is the axon terminal, and here is that terminal bouton. And inside, we've already seen this image, inside we have our vesicles containing what? Neurotransmitters. And just like before, those neurotransmitters, here we have acetylcholine. Now here is our synaptic cleft just like we saw before. And across the synaptic cleft, here we have a membrane, and along that membrane, what do we have? There's our ligand-gated, or chemically-gated channels that acetylcholine binds to. But what's different in this image is when we saw it before, it was a neuron a synaptic cleft, and another neuron. But it may be a little bit difficult to tell here. What we're actually looking at is a neuron, a synaptic cleft, and a muscle cell surface. It's going to behave almost exactly the same. The events are going to be exactly the same as what we saw when we drew out what happens at a synapse. The only difference is it is a neuron talking to a muscle cell instead of another neuron, and we are not going to really get much of a graded potential because what's this guy right here? That's a voltage-gated sodium channel. We know that because of his little inactivation gate, the wrecking ball. So, when we send an action potential to a muscle cell, we are going to get an action potential develop in that muscle cell. We don't have to wait until the entire muscle cell gets to something kind of like, uh, remember we had in a neuron, we had the axon hillock. That's not the case here. Right next to this synapse, there are voltage-gated sodium channels, so it's much easier to cause an action potential in a muscle cell. Okay, so we said this is a neuron, we have our synaptic cleft, and we have a muscle cell. This is a synapse. This is a synapse. It's just another type of synapse. This type of synapse is called a neuromuscular junction. So this is what we just saw that photomicrograph of. Let's quickly, we're not going to draw this out because we've already drawn this out, but let's talk through what's happening here. An action potential is traveling down this axon. How is it doing it? Well, remember, along the membrane, we have all of those proteins that we drew. The action potential that we drew in a neuron is traveling along this membrane of this neuron. We don't see all of those proteins there, but they are. They're there. And when we get to the terminal bouton, the axon terminal, what happens? We have those new voltage-gated channels, the voltage-gated calcium channels. They open at threshold. Calcium high outside the cell, non-existent or packed away inside the cell. Because what does calcium do when it comes into the cell like we see here? it binds to those vesicles. When calcium binds to the vesicles, what does it do? 
it causes them to travel to the edge of the cell and those vesicles merge with the plasma membrane and whatever's inside of them gets exocytosed. It gets dumped out of the cell into the synaptic cleft. It diffuses across that cleft and it binds to our ligand gated channels that are specific to acetylcholine. They open and just like we saw at a neuron, what happens? Sodium rushes in. When sodium comes into this muscular cell, what happens? It's going to start to depolarize and it doesn't take much. We only have to get this area right here to threshold and that happens really easy. As soon as we get to threshold, voltage gated sodium channel opens and now an action potential begins in the muscle cell. And an action potential along the surface of a muscle cell is the exact same as a muscle, I mean, as an action potential along an axon. All of those things we drew when we were drawing the action potential down an axon is happening along the surface of this muscle cell. The only difference is resting potential is negative 90 in a muscle cell. Remember we said in neurons it was negative 70, but we also said that even though it's negative, every cell in the body, different cells have different resting potentials. In the case of a muscle cell, resting potential is negative 90. <clears throat> so an action potential comes, we get to threshold, voltage gated sodium channels open, we depolarize, same exact thing, we get to positive 30, voltage gated sodium channels inactivate, voltage gated potassium channels open, we repolarize. But when we repolarize and the voltage gated potassium channels close, we do not get a hyperpolarization. Why not? Because remember what hyperpolarization went to? About negative 90, which is resting. For a muscle cell, we don't go below that because we're already at negative 90. So that is the action potential graph of a muscle cell, almost identical to the action potential graph of a neuron. The only difference, negative 90 resting potential and no hyperpolarization because resting is negative 90. So here is that neuromuscular junction again. This is what we just saw in cartoon form. Action potential is traveling down the axon. It gets to those terminal boutons. And even though we can't see it, this is where all that acetylcholine would be released onto the muscle cell. An action potential develops and travels along the muscle cell. Action potential travels down the axon, gets to the axon terminal, calcium rushes in, acetylcholine is dumped out, opens those ligand gated channels, action potential develops, travels along the surface of the muscle cell. So let's take a look at a cartoon that depicts that. Maybe, if I can get this. To be a pointer again. Okay. Got that working. Nerve, Nerve impulses, impulses, also, also known, known as action, action potentials, potentials, travel from the brain or spinal cord to trigger the contraction of skeletal muscles. An action potential propagates down a motor neuron to a skeletal muscle fiber.
The site where a motor neuron excites a skeletal muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction. This junction is a chemical synapse consisting of the points of contact between the axon terminals of a motor neuron and the motor end plate of a skeletal muscle fiber. The events at the neuromuscular junction occur in seven coordinated steps. Step 1. An action potential travels the length of the axon of a motor neuron to an axon terminal. Step 2. Voltage-gated calcium channels open and calcium ions diffuse into the terminal. Step 3. Calcium entry causes synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine via exocytosis. Step 4. Acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to acetylcholine receptors which contain ligand-gated cation channels. Step 5. These ligand-gated cation channels open. Step 6. Sodium ions, shown here in red, enter the muscle fiber, and potassium ions, shown here in blue, exit the muscle fiber. The greater inward flux of sodium ions relative to the outward flux of potassium ions causes the membrane potential to become less negative. Step 7. Once the membrane potential reaches a threshold value, an action potential propagates along the sarcolemma. Neural transmission to a muscle fiber ceases when acetylcholine is removed from the synaptic cleft. This removal occurs in two ways. One, acetylcholine diffuses away from the synapse. Two, acetylcholine is broken down by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase to acetic acid and choline. Choline is then transported into the axon terminal for the resynthesis of acetylcholine. All right, so we had our action potential passed from one neuron to a muscle cell that it formed a synapse with. Now we've seen that it causes our depolarization. We go through the full action potential. The action potential spreads, it travels down the muscle cell in all directions. But now we're going to find out how does that action potential cause anything to happen. Well, remember all along the surface of the muscle cell where we have that muscle cell membrane, the sarcolemma, there were those openings where we said there was an extension that went through the muscle cell. Here is that drawing that we used for that. All along the plasma membrane, there were openings and then the plasma membrane folded inward and traveled through the muscle cell and it branched as it did so, wrapping around all of those myofibrils. This was called a T-tubule. And the T-tubule has on either side of it a part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum called the terminal cisterni. One T-tubule and both of those terminal cisterni, the one on either side of it, we said was called a triad. And I said that that triad would come back in a future lecture. Well, that's where we are now. So, action potential comes down. Vesicles release acetylcholine. Action potential develops, travels along the plasma membrane or the sarcolemma. It travels down the T-tubule because, remember, the T-tubule is just an extension 
of the sarcolemma. It's made of the exact same stuff, including all of those proteins needed for action potentials. So if an action potential is traveling along the sarcolemma, it's also going to travel down the T-tubule, which is the important part here. An action potential is now traveling down the T-tubules. Here we have a very, very zoomed in area of a triad. Here our action potential is traveling along the surface of that muscle cell, along the sarcolemma. It also is going to travel down the T-tubule because again, it is sarcolemma. So action potential is traveling down the T-tubule but scattered all the way down the length of that T-tubule, we have our triads. And at a triad, we have a terminal cistern on one side, a terminal cistern on the other. And in addition to all of those proteins that carry an action potential, which we don't see here, there is another type of protein that's serving two purposes. One, it is anchoring that terminal cistern to the T-tubule and two, it is a voltage-gated calcium channel. And it's a special type of voltage-gated calcium channel. It's called a ryanodine receptor, but it is a voltage-gated calcium channel. So let's look real quick to see exactly how this triad is laid out. Here's one terminal cistern. Here's the other terminal cistern. They are being held to the T-tubule by those ryanodine receptors. And if we look closely, we see the rest of the terminal cistern. It's not bumped directly against the T-tubule there is some space there. When the action potential gets to the ryanodine receptor, it causes it to change shape. It opens. What's inside of a terminal cistern? Well, terminal cistern is part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is smooth endoplasmic reticulum. What's inside of smooth endoplasmic reticulum? calcium. So the voltage-gated calcium channel opens, calcium rushes out, and it rushes out and into that gap, which is the interior of the muscle cell where all of those myofibrils are found. So calcium is now open inside this muscle cell. What does calcium do when it is inside of a cell? It likes to bind to things. Okay, so up here at the top, here is a very zoomed in image of one myosin head and part of the rest of the myosin. Remember, this is repeating, repeating, repeating. But here is one myosin head. Here is a thin filament, just a small section of it. Each of these little blueberries is an actin molecule, but all of them together, this is our thin filament. We can see this long spaghetti yellow looking thing that's lying along the actin. This is tropomyosin. And holding on to the tropomyosin and the actin is troponin. Troponin is holding the tropomyosin in such a way that it covers up that active site on the actin. This muscle is at rest. But we just sent an action potential, and that action potential caused calcium to suddenly be present inside this muscle cell. What does calcium do? It binds to things. One thing that it likes to bind to is troponin. So calcium, when it is present in a muscle cell, why is it present? 
because an action potential released it. So when calcium is present in a muscle cell, it binds to troponin. Anytime something binds to or is removed from a protein, what happens? The protein changes shape. So troponin is going to change shape now that calcium binds to it. It bends forward a little bit. And when it does, what's attached to it? Tropomyosin. If troponin was holding tropomyosin in place over those active sites, but then troponin changes shape, it's going to pull the tropomyosin along with it. The tropomyosin moves and now those active sites are exposed. Back when we were first learning about actin and myosin, what did we say those active sites? Who really, really likes those? Myosin heads. He couldn't do anything about it because the active sites were covered up, but now they're not. So what happens? The myosin head suddenly can attach to those active sites, and he does. What do we call that? When a myosin head attaches to actin. This is a cross bridge. A cross bridge was formed. Let's quickly sum that whole thing up. Action potential comes down a muscle cell. Action potential travels down a T-tubule, causes the ryanodine, which is just a voltage-gated calcium channel, to open. Calcium inside the terminal cistern of the uh, uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum opens, calcium inside, rushes out. Calcium is now inside the muscle cell. It binds to troponin, causes troponin to move, to change shape, to bend forward. That pulls tropomyosin with it, exposing the active sites on actin, which allows the myosin head to attach, forming a cross bridge. Okay, so now we're going to go back and see that in action. Where did it go? Here we are. So when a neuron tells a muscle to contract, we call that excitation contraction coupling. Excitation contraction coupling. In the previous video, we, well, the video that I just played in this lecture, that was the excitation part. We sent an action potential to the muscle. This is the coupling part. In just a few minutes, we're going to watch the contraction part. This is the part that actually couples the excitation to the contraction. So let's watch. Typically, a single motor neuron arising in the brain or spinal cord conducts action potentials that travel to hundreds of skeletal muscle fibers within a muscle. The sequence of events that converts action potentials in a muscle fiber to a contraction is known as excitation-contraction coupling. If we look at a single muscle fiber, we see that an action potential travels across the entire sarcolemma and is rapidly conducted into the interior of the muscle fiber by structures called transverse tubules. Transverse, or T-tubules, are regularly spaced in foldings of the sarcolemma that branch extensively throughout the muscle fiber. At numerous junctions, the T-tubules make contact with a calcium-storing membranous network known as a sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. Where it abuts the T-tubule, the SR forms sac-like bulges called terminal cisterni. One portion of a T-tubule plus two adjacent terminal cisterni is known as a triad. The membranes of the T-tubule and terminal cisterni are linked by a series of proteins that control calcium release. As an action potential travels down the T-tubule, it causes a voltage-sensitive protein to change shape. 
This shape change opens a calcium release channel in the SR, allowing calcium ions to flood the sarcoplasm. This rapid influx of calcium triggers a contraction of the skeletal muscle fiber. Thus, calcium ions are responsible for the coupling of excitation to the contraction of skeletal muscle fibers. So we're going to see now how that calcium causes a contraction, like it said at the end of that video. Even though we don't see it here, at rest, before the myosin head does anything at all, attached to it is a molecule of ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and an inorganic phosphate. Remember, inorganic phosphate is phosphate that is not really attached to much of anything. It's kind of attached to the myosin head, but it's not a true attachment, so we just still call it inorganic phosphate. We will see that in a moment, but it's important to know that even though we don't see it here in this image, ADP and inorganic phosphate are attached to the myosin head when it is just sitting there doing nothing. So we have our cross bridge formed and it is formed because there is calcium present inside the cell. What happens at this level once we form a cross bridge that allows a contraction to happen? Here we go. We're going to start at the top. There's our ADP and our inorganic phosphate. Here is our cross bridge, so we are picking up right where we left off. Again, nothing. All of a sudden it's exposed because of calcium. Cross bridge forms, and that's where we pick up up here at number one. Cross bridge has formed. Now some things are going to happen really, really quickly. So let's go through this cycle. As soon as the cross bridge is formed, Inorganic phosphate is released. Inorganic phosphate is released. And when the inorganic phosphate releases, it causes this bond between myosin and actin, the cross bridge, to get stronger. Myosin attaches harder to actin when the inorganic phosphate falls off. When the myosin attaches harder to actin, it causes the ADP to fall off. That's why I have this asterisk here, because it kind of sums all that up in one thing, but it's actually two separate steps. Cross bridge forms, phosphate falls off, cross bridge strengthens, ADP falls off. Before we follow up with that, Think for a moment why those things happened. Everything we're talking about here, actin, myosin, troponin, tropomyosin, all of those are proteins. Anytime you add something to or take something away from a protein, it changes shape. It changes shape, which means it changes its properties. So when myosin and actin attached to each other, that causes some changes in myosin. It doesn't like phosphate anymore. The phosphate falls off. When phosphate falls off, it changes the myosin a little bit more. Now myosin in that state likes actin even more than it did. It attaches harder to the actin. When it attaches harder to the actin, that causes it not to like ADP anymore, so the ADP falls off. When ADP falls off, we just removed something from the myosin. What's it going to do? It's going to change shape. It's going to actually bend forward. And by forward, I mean it's moving in a direction towards the M line. Here is a zoomed in part of what we're looking at. So 
everything on the right side, this is some actin from the right side of the sarcomere, getting pushed towards the M line. Not very much at all. It would not be perceptible if we were to see this one little bit of movement happen. But the myosin head pushes forward. This is called the power stroke. The power stroke. It, the myosin pushed the act, actin towards the M line. Well, when this myosin bends forward in this state, it really likes ATP. So ATP floating around in the cell binds to the myosin. When ATP binds to the myosin, that provides the energy needed to break the cross bridge. ATP energy broke the cross bridge. And when it does that, it splits, it hydrolyzes the ATP into what? ADP and inorganic phosphate. But when ADP and inorganic phosphate, when they split from each other, that cocks the myosin head back. We say it's now put into the high energy position. And as long as there is still calcium in the cell, that means the binding sites or the active sites on actin are still available, we go through this again and again and again and again and again. One single cross bridge cycle does not visibly or noticeably shorten the muscle. But this doesn't really happen just once. Just once, this is that twitch that we talked about in lab. This, in reality, goes on a lot and the fact that it happens a lot means we do get noticeable shortening of the muscle. So let's watch another video to see the actual contraction part. Okay, we said that excitation contraction coupling was really the whole process. We saw the excitation as the uh, action potential was passed from the neuron to the muscle cell. We saw the excitation contraction coupling portion as the calcium was released. But now we're going to see the actual contraction part. And this, remember how an, a myosin filament was was uh, how it appeared. It did not just have a single head coming off in one direction. When we were looking at it in the previous lecture, we saw that there were lots of myosin heads and they stuck off in all directions. That's gonna be important for what we see in this video. The contraction of a skeletal muscle generates the force necessary to move the skeleton. A contraction is triggered by a series of molecular events known as the cross-bridge cycle. In a skeletal muscle fiber, the functional unit of contraction is called the sarcomere. A sarcomere shortens when myosin heads in thick myofilaments form cross-bridges with actin molecules in thin myofilaments. The formation of a cross bridge is initiated when calcium ions released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum bind to troponin. This binding causes troponin to change shape. Tropomyosin moves away from the myosin binding sites on actin, allowing the myosin head to bind actin and form a cross bridge. Also note that the myosin head must be activated before a cross-bridge cycle can begin.
This occurs, this occurs when ATP binds to the myosin, to the myosin head and is, and is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy liberated from the hydrolysis of ATP activates the myosin head, forcing it into the cocked position. A cross-bridge cycle may be divided into four steps. Step 1. Cross-bridge formation. The activated myosin head binds to actin, forming a cross-bridge. Inorganic phosphate is released and the bond between myosin and actin becomes stronger. Step 2, the power stroke. ADP is released and the activated myosin head pivots, sliding the thin myofilament toward the center of the sarcomere. Step 3, cross-bridge detachment. When another ATP binds to the myosin head, the link between the myosin head and actin weakens and the myosin head detaches. Step 4. Reactivation of the myosin head. ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy released during hydrolysis reactivates the myosin head, returning it to the cocked position. As long as the binding sites on actin remain exposed, the crossbridge cycle will repeat. And as the cycle repeats, the thin myofilaments are pulled toward each other and the sarcomere shortens. This shortening causes the whole muscle to contract. Cross-bridge cycling ends when calcium ions are actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Troponin returns to its original shape allowing tropomyosin to glide over and cover the myosin binding site on actin. Okay, so now we've seen excitation, we've seen contraction, we've seen the coupling of the two together, excitation, contraction, coupling. So that's what causes a muscle to contract. And then what we saw a little bit of at the end of that video was how do we get the muscle to relax again? So what happens to cause the relaxation? Well, we have to first get rid of that calcium. So when the action potential stops coming from the motor neuron, we have no more stimulation. If there's no more stimulation, then those ryanidine receptors, those special calcium channels, close. So calcium stops being put into the muscle cell. There is another type of protein all along the sarcoplasmic reticulum called calciquestrin. Calciquestrin pumps calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the calcium falls off of the troponin to move back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the troponin moves back into its initial shape, pulling tropomyosin back over the active site on the actin. Myosin can no longer form a cross bridge. And the titan, remember that springy protein at the end of the thick filaments, it pulls everything back to its original position. So that's how we get the relaxation after the contraction. But let's take a look at a bit of a special case, rigor mortis. Rigor mortis is the contraction of muscle following death and that's something that naturally occurs sometime after death the muscles of the body will become very very contracted and in some cases it can cause dead bodies to noticeably move which if you know to expect it 
even then it can still be a little bit unsettling because you're seeing movement from a fully dead body. What is it that's happening there? Well, all of those events that we just looked at, they are chemical reactions. None of them require any energy except for breaking the cross bridge. So let's go back to our cross bridge cycle. Even though there are no neurons sending signals, we can still get a little bit of action here. After death, the muscles go completely limp. Remember, when you are alive, even when your muscles are relaxed, there's still something called tonus or muscle tone. We saw that in lab. That was that constant state of contraction, not a full contraction. But this is even when you are asleep, even when you are at your most relaxed, your nerves are always sending a little bit of background signal to your muscles. So your muscles are always contracting a little bit. But once you are dead, or if you are paralyzed, then your muscles go completely relaxed. There is no stimulation to those muscles. So that is, if, you, if you've ever had the unfortunate experience of moving a recently dead body, uh, a, a person, a pet, anything like that, you know that it is a completely different feeling than moving someone who's asleep. When, when something is dead, there is no stimulation of those muscles and it feels completely different because of that pure relaxation. And that stays that way for quite a while. Depending on the environment, you know, it can be a few hours or several hours. But at some point, what happens is protein starts to break down. Those ryanidine receptors start to break down. The sarcoplasmic reticulum itself starts to break down. And the result is the inside of muscle cells begin to flood with calcium. And even though the person is not alive, chemical reactions will still happen. Chemical reactions can happen in a glass jar. If calcium is present, well, it's going to bind to things, including troponin. And when it binds to troponin, it's going to go through all of these steps. We're going to have the tropomyosin pulled out of the way. We're going to have a cross bridge form, and we're going to go through. We get down here. There is still ATP present in the muscle. We're going to go through these cross bridge cycles. We're going to get contraction. The muscles are going to stiffen. They're going to get contracted until we run out of the ATP that's there because even though these other chemical reactions do not require life, making ATP does because now we're not breathing. So we don't make more ATP. We use up the ATP that's there and then we get stuck where? with the cross bridge formed. We can't break the cross bridge because there's no ATP. So the muscles contract and then they stay contracted. That's what rigor mortis is. And rigor mortis takes a while. It will be in that contracted state until enough time passes that the proteins of the filaments begin to degrade. So the actin, the myosin, the tropin and the tropomyosin, all of those begin to decay, at which point kind of, it's not really the cross bridge detaches, it's the whole thing just kind of deteriorates. And then the muscles are relaxed again. So that's how you can kind of tell how long it's been since someone has died based on things like temperature, location, all that kind of stuff has to be taken into account. But if you do take that into account, there's a certain amount of time after death when muscles are completely limp, 
and then there's a time during rigor mortis when muscles are contracted and then there's a time after rigor mortis when the muscles are deteriorate so they relax again that's what's happening during rigor mortis okay that's where we will stop today i know that was a long lecture compared to some of the others that we have but that was a very important bit of information that is something that will be expected to be known in bio 139 it will not be reviewed it's just going to be expected that you know it because when we talk about cardiac muscle it also follows cross bridge cycling using sarcomeres so we will end there we have one more lecture in muscle we will talk about that next time i hope you enjoyed the lecture this was a fun one i think and i will see you in the next lecture take care